We are back to poetry now, um, and we have 30 minutes, 10 minutes presentation by Catherine Mason. She's opening up the history again. Catherine Mason will uh, give a short presentation about um, poetry and AI from yesterday to tomorrow, but, and then she will bring Sasha Styles on stage. Uh, wonderful Sasha Styles, poetry of, of our, our new times here, um, pioneer of generative literature and language, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this uh, 30 minutes. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Susanna. So yes, we're going back to the 1970s here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about George Mallon. Um, and some British work from the late 60s and 70s that is actually not very well known. Well, in 1969, George Mallon, who was one of the founders of the Computer Arts Society, wrote, the creative processes of artists are thought to be extremely complex. How may computer technology be harnessed to assist, to inspire, and to improve these processes? Well, Mallon was born in 1939, and he is a pioneer of creative computing since 1962. And as you can see here, his early days working with the cybernetician Gordon Pask at uh, Pask's company Systems Research in West London put him in a very unique position to consider how digital technologies that came out of World War II could be harnessed for the public good. And his was an optimistic approach to the notion of progress and he believed that societal change could be brought about using technology informed by the principles of cybernetics. Uh, cybernetics is the theoretical study of the control processes in electronic, mechanical, and biological systems, very simply put. And as we know it today, cybernetics was uh, developed and um, described by the American Norbert Weiner, who said it was the science of communication control in the animal and the machine, or the communication between an, within an observer and between the observer and their environment. So Gordon Pask, the uh, founder of Systems Research, was a British cybernetician, and he met Viner at um, Cambridge. He called himself a philosopher engineer, and the important point about this was that, um, I mean, he was a polymath, really, but the important point was that he, he wasn't just about theory, he actually made things. And here you can see um, his music color machine um, from really from a very early date. Now this was a machine that he constructed entirely himself, and it crossed the fields of art, music, performance, and science, and it's probably the first cybernetically inspired performance system in the UK. And he used to put on um, live exhibitions using this machine, which was a, a, an interaction between the, the, the artist, the, the user of the machine, um, and the machine itself. So it was a true kind of symbiosis. Well, with the example of cybernetics, um, the computer could then have the potential to be more than just a design tool. It could also be an agent for allowing interactivity and an ability to connect more closely with an audience. And it was with Gordon Pass that Mallon first began to use digital simulation to model human thought processes. How can the digital be used as a simulation of the mind? Now, Pass's conversation theory had an impact on George Mallon. And conversation theory um, is really, you can see here um, uh, in his work, uh, Colloquy of Mobiles that was exhibited at the um, Cybernetic Serendipity Show um, in 1968. And it was about um, learning in both organisms and machines. It was an attempt to explain learning. So the fundamental idea of conversation theory is that learning occurs through conversations about subject matter, which serve to make knowledge explicit. So this um, Colloquy of Mobiles, which is hanging from the ceiling, uh, it consisted of male and female robotic figures that interacted with each other, and they reacted also to the audience, and they learned as they did so, and they attempted to reach a state of agreement or a state of homeostasis, a kind of cybernetic concept. So it's an early precursor to AI art. Well, the Computer Arts Society was conceived in the wake of cybernetic serendipity um, in late 1968, and we call it CAS for short. Uh, together with Mallon, there was also John Lansdowne, who was an architect and had an interest in early CAD design systems. Alan Sutcliffe, a programmer. So the three of them founded the society to explore the possibilities of using computers in a creative context. It was based in London, but it had an international outreach. Members in Europe, North and South America, Japan, and in 1970, there was even one member in Australia. 
Well, one issue that was becoming very clear at this time was the implications of the role of the artist in the computational age. Would the artist of the future have any role at all? Um, in fact, is the artist going to be amplified or superseded by the computer? And this was asked by two CAS members, Stroud Cornick and Ernest Edmonds, who you can see in the photograph there. Ernest Edmonds, who's been with us uh, throughout this um, conference and will come later on in a panel, uh, a great uh, British pioneer of art using digital interactive systems. And they gave a very prescient paper in 1970 at the University of Leicester, um, where they argued that artists could in fact have a greatly amplified role and one that was integrated with societal concerns. And to do this, they could use the actual methods and technology, the digital, of the society in which they found themselves. Well, um, the first um, exhibition of the Computer Art Society was Event One at the Royal College of Art in 1969. And it really showed the definition, uh, the future direction of the society. And this was a culture of sharing and cooperation that very much existed at CAS and still does today. It was a desire to promote creative computing in all art forms based on an understanding of cybernetics, which would allow interactivity um, and more collaborative meaning making for art than had hitherto been known. And artists and programmers collaborated together. So here you can see some installation shots of the um, exhibition, including a view of the stage down there. Um, here's some of the work that was on view. We saw, those of you who attended the film night um, from Larry Cuba last night saw a little clip of the Flexipede there. That's in the um, top left-hand corner. In the top right-hand corner, um, you've got uh, Gustav Metzger's model for a big proposal, five screens with computer. Um, you've also got John Lansdowne on the lower, right, uh, lower left-hand side there. Um, he produced computer-generated choreography for um, dancers. Uh, he's sitting at his teletype, and these are dancers from the Royal um, Ballet School in London. Uh, and then we've also got a, a, an Im image from the uh, newspaper on the far um, lower right-hand side of um, uh, the sword fight, John Lansdowne's sword fight, um, and the Evening Standard came along and photographed that. And this was a computer choreographed sword fight. So CAS members believed in a very positive human-machine interrelationship made visible through art. And then after this, um, the next big project was the Eco Game of 1970, and this was led by George Mallon, but involved many members of the Computer Arts Society. And it was an interactive multimedia controlled simulation that modeled an economic system a very early example of computing technology used in a large-scale simulated environment with the theme of cooperation and competition. And it dealt with um, opportune issues of ecology and environment. And you can see that here in this lovely drawing um, by uh, John McNulty, uh, which shows a participant going through his um, decision-making decision process um, informed by ecological concerns, environmental and societal choices. Um, and the visuals of this game, many CAS members um, worked on it, and the visuals of this game were displayed on screens above that you can see here on the lower right of the screen, 720 35 millimeter slides that were computer controlled. So depending on the level of affluence in the game um, um, and the economic model that it was simulating, the players had control of this, and it would flash up different images depending on how well or how poor you were doing. So if you were doing very well um, from a social point of view, then you might get positive images of the future. Um, but if you were doing very badly from, a, from an economic point of view, then you might get pictures of Victorian slums, for example. So this was a live interaction over a network that was all of the terminals were linked to a remote time-sharing computer. Um, using technology that had never been put together in such a way before. So after being shown in London, it was exhibited at the very first uh, Davos, the first World Economic Forum in 1971. It was a slightly different setup. There wasn't a dome there. But Stafford Beer, who was a British pioneer in cybernetics, came along and saw the eco game, and as a result, utilized some of the slide projection technology as part of his infrastructure for his Project Cybersyn proposal in 1971 to 73 which was sadly never realized because it was abandoned um, after a coup in um, Chile. It was for the Salvador Elande government in Chile. It was a proposal um, about decision-making and the effects that that would have on the system. Now, some, I'm going to talk a little bit about poetry now. Something else that uh, CAS members were very interested in um, was computer-generated poetry. And uh, I've just got time to show you three examples uh, of people who really aren't very well known today but deserve to be. 
And one was, of course, um, Alan Sutcliffe, who was one of the founders of CAS, and he was a programmer at ICL, one of the big computer companies at the time. Um, and this is an example from his SPASMO project, which was a spoken text project of 1969. Um, and again, it in involved audience interaction. So um, um, the poems were all generated by his Fortran algorithm, and each was printed out at a unique poem on each printout from a run of 256. And the audience would, would read out different parts of the poem, depending on directions given by the artist from the stage. Robin Shirley was another um, Kaz poet. He was a crystallographer by profession, but he also loved generative poetry. Um, and in 1968, he wrote his own software, call, software called Bard. And that um, uh, is an example shown here from one of his um, uh, poems called uh, Pavan of the Children of Deep Space, based on science fiction. And this, again, had hundreds and hundreds of stanzas printed out. Uh, Shirley ran the, probably the, the very first funded computer poetry group probably in the world, but certainly in the UK, he actually persuaded his university to fund a computer-generated poetry group, which is astounding, really. Peter, Kil Peter Kilgannon was another um, poet, just to finish off, who um, uh, associated with CAS, and his, his day job was as a systems analyst and a specialist in computer data processing, but he did exhibit um, computer-generated poetry. Here you can see a flow chart outlining how um, he got his program to work. His program was called Lyric, uh, and it had a database of words and a series of instructions to create text from this. He could also insert a degree of randomness into the program. He then would re-edit and rework the output. So this is an example of reworked output um, the, the, called the replacement. By the way, these poems that I have just shown you here, this is a, the original um, thermo paper printout, uh, have all been rediscovered by me um, and have never been seen in public since the time that they were um, devised. Um, uh, they were all found in George Mallon's archive. So finally, the unashamed plug. Uh, if you would like to know more about this period of early work, do check out um, my books, and they um, feature many pictures and ex explanations of the eco game. Um, and you can also follow me um, on Instagram, uh, because I post a lot about the history here. Um, and uh, I also have some work in the latest book, which is Creative Simulations, that just came out last week. I, I try to bring it up to date a little bit, and we have some, a wonderful picture by Sarah Ridgely, who we saw earlier, and Christian Bach, um, as well as um, a wonderful poem, a short poem by Sasha Stiles, also appears in the book. So you can check that out. Anyway, I'm now going to um, move on, and uh, we can welcome Sasha Stiles up to the stage. Uh, I don't think she needs much introduction for this audience, but she is an award-winning poet and, uh, and artist. Um, and I will just say that she has a background in language and literature, and she has adopted generative tools as parts of her practice. She's been recognized by the Lumen Prize, the Pushcart Prize, and Christie's, among others. Um, and her work often incorporates nature's, uh, elements of nature and an investigation into non-human intelligence. So we'd like to have a nice discussion with Sasha and find out um, how poetry has changed, perhaps, from these days of 1968-1969. Uh, yeah, welcome, Sasha. Thank you. Um, and it's really great to have you here um, uh, to talk about poetry. And one thing that really strikes me from looking at a selection that we've just seen of poets from the late 60s is the importance of their day job, so to speak, um, because this it obviously enabled them access to the technology um, because you couldn't get access to mainframes unless you worked at an institution. Um, but it was also because it was very hard to make a living as a poet at that time. So I just wonder if you could re reflect on um, what things are like now in the 21st century about accessing machines and data. Sure, I would love to address that. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for everything you're doing to unearth these sort of hidden or obscure treasures of computational poetry. It's been really fascinating to learn from you. and. Um, uh, hi, everyone. This has been an incredible, incredible event. So thank you, Susanna and, and Annika and everyone who's been involved in this and Doro. Um, very, I'm leaving here very full of, of inspiration yes, and a little too. intimidated. Yes, me too. <laughs> um, so um, I guess to answer your question and provide a bit of background, so I'm a, I'm a lifelong poet. I studied English um, as a student um, and I continued my studies, uh, you know, as a graduate student as well. So I don't actually have any formal training in AI 
or in computer science or any of these things. So I'm somewhat surprised that I've ended up doing as much work as I do now um, with AI. But I would say, you know, even though I, I have been writing poetry for a long time, I think I've always done it in a somewhat non-traditional way. Um, I've always been very drawn, on the one hand, to poetry that kind of veers into the territory of language art. Okay. And kind of grew up very interested in text-based art, as well as concrete poetry, visual mm. poetry, mm. conceptual and experimental yes. poetry by people like Christian, yes. um, who you mentioned. Um, so there's that piece of it. Um, but I think like the other part of it that is germane to what you're asking is that I grew up in a house very suffused with interest in science and technology and engineering. Um, my parents are actually documentary filmmakers who do a lot of work um, in, in that realm, and it's just always sort of been the air that I breathed. And so from a very young age, I think I grew up thinking of science as a kind of poetry, and that there's a beauty to things like astronomy and physics, um, to math, that there really is you know, just a huge creative flight of imagination to get to any sort of scientific discovery. And so I, I think that's always been you know, in the back of my head. And yeah. so all my life I've been writing, writing a lot of poetry about about technology, about science, about these sort of big questions, and about sort of seeing beyond what we can see right now. So I think thematically that kind of pushed me into the territory that I'm in now, but I needed a little bit of help, I think, to yes. go from you know, where I was, which was in, you know, in academia, and I wasn't studying poetry, I was studying postmodern literature. Okay. Um, and studying, you know, a lot of writers who broke language in their own way, studying okay. um, James Joyce and Thomas Pynchon, uh, you know, the post post postmodern, and uh, Virginia Woolf and Stein and all those, you know, Gertrude Stein and all those folks. But um, I needed, you know, a little bit of help, I think, to go from um, those studies to this territory um, of AI, of AI yeah. and multimedia and digital and cybernetic poetry. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I've been sort of cultivating an interest for a long time and self-studying. I was kind of an autodidact and, you know, just immersing myself in books by Ray Kurzweil and Nick Bostrom and folks like that. Um, but I really wanted to have some hands-on experience with AI. And when I started to really get interested um, in about 2016, uh, in AI poetry was because I saw people like Ross Goodwin, like Gordon Branwyn, um, like Alison Parrish, who, you know, were doing really fascinating things, mm -hmm. but they were doing very niche things. Right. And it was really, it was fascinating, but I found that I had to go digging to find more of the information that I was craving. Um, so one of the ways that I did that, you know, beyond reading a lot of white papers and reaching out to people like Ross very embarrassingly on Instagram and asking if he would talk to me, you know, things like that. Um, I actually volunteered myself to do things like become a poetry mentor to a humanoid android named okay. Bina48, okay. who some of you might know, and she's, she's done some work with um, wonderful artists like Stephanie Dinkins. But I, you know, I wanted to have a chance to work with the team behind her development because yes. it was an opportunity, I think, to to think through you know, some of the conceptual and philosophical reasons why a creature like her might exist, but then also to get my hands into her mind file yes. and to actually look at all the data um, that was being you know, pooled together into this, uh, this massive database. And I was able to actually see how she takes all that data and then synthesizes it and outputs you know, unique creative conversation. And I was able to actually work with those teams to start you know, bringing my purview as a, as a visual poet um, to the equation and like, you know, thinking about things like how do, we, how do we translate this data? How do we translate this kind of ephemeral uh, text-based information into something that is more intelligible to us, something that we can really kind of see and grasp? Mm -hmm. You know, these systems are operating in high dimensional space and it's very abstract, especially for someone like me. Yes. So I was able to work with the whole team there and actually build systems for visualizing data and actually building mind maps, dynamic mind maps that to me were um, maybe a kind, of, uh, a kind of visual or concrete poetry in themselves where mm -hmm. the words were moving and the movement of those words and the association and the patterns of those words to one another reflected this AI's 
understanding um, of them. That's fascinating. So, so it's still important to find a collaborative team to work with, just perhaps as, as in the old days, um, and to, and to you know, get an insight that you might not otherwise have been able to, to get on your own. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So um, why, how did you come to actually use AI? Why did you decide to do it? Um, well, there are a lot of reasons. I think, you know, one is that I'm a, I'm a poet. I love to play with language, and I think that really is the first and foremost reason. I think the kind of poetry that I've always loved to write is very much about wordplay, and it's very much about the tactility of language. Language as a material, like language as a substance that I can play with um, the way that any artist might play, play with their material. Mm. And when I started to learn, you know, through some of the folks that I mentioned earlier about natural language processing, um, and this, you know, this arena where computer science and linguistics and intelligent systems were colliding, I instantly saw that it was it was about wordplay yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. It's about yeah. it's about language and it's yeah. about the things that I, as a poet, think about all the time, which is how does this word relate to this word? How does this idea spark this idea? You know, what are the pathways? What are the associations? Great. All of those things. And, um, and I, I just couldn't resist sort of diving in, even though, like, like I said before, it was um, a little intimidating at first, coming from the curve. humanities background. <laughs> yeah, very steep learning yeah. curve. Well, like the um, CAS activities that we saw, poetry was certainly not mainstream at the time. Would you say that it's a little getting a little more mainstream now with the use of AI? Or, or, or is there more visibility now? That AI poetry is becoming yes. or poetry in general? Well, let's, let's stick with the AI since we're, we're talking about AI okay. conference here. Um, well, yeah, I would, no, I think it's still quite niche. Um, yeah. So when I really started writing with AI um, in, a, in, a, in a more deliberate way in 2018 mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. into 2019, um, I remember, you know, taking some of my early experiments into poetry workshops, and it was widely derided. Oh, dear. <laughs> it was, I mean, the reaction, I think, is very familiar to a lot of us who use AI now, which is that, you know, what I was creating um, was lazy, uh, that it wasn't actually poetry, that it was soulless, that, um, that it was basically a cheat. And that has actually, I think, you know, that sort of persisted as a, I think, a common reaction yeah. to the idea of generating poetry. There's actually stipulations in place with a lot of literary journals now that you're not allowed to submit anything made with AI, okay. which is one of the reasons why I kind of so came running it. into the world of new media and yes. blockchain and places that were a bit more receptive. Yeah. And, you, and your work has a very visual aspect to it too, doesn't it? It's, it's not just written on a page. But you did go on to found the verse first, didn't you? So that was a way to sort of get it out there in the world into a more conducive environment so that people could see it. Yeah, so I, I came to the metaverse and blockchain kind of at the end of 2020, which was I think a little bit late, but like I said, I kind of, I came to it because I was making things with AI and with, you know, multimedia tools that I couldn't publish in traditional channels, whether that was, you know, more of a cultural hesitation or whether it was a uh, logistical limitation on not being able to publish mm -hmm. generative or digital work. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I was very lucky in is that when I came to the blockchain, um, I met, you know, some really wonderful writers and artists who, you know, had had a similar view that there was an opportunity to, you know, create a space to do things with literature, digital literature that we couldn't do in any other any place. Other and so um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Verse Verse. Mm -hmm. um, another of our co-founders, Anna Maria, is actually here and will be speaking next. And we have a third co-founder, Callan Iwamoto, who's a wonderful conceptual writer. Okay. And we, you know, we all decided it would be really, I think, meaningful um, to create a space that was dedicated to this idea, um, you know, that that language is both an art form and is also a technology in different ways. Yes. That language, you know, doesn't have to sort of be limited by our preconceived notions of it, especially in this time that we're living in, when language really and large language models are powering so much of the uh, our daily the change, life. the transformation, yeah. most of our daily life, exactly. Yeah. 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 Now, tell us a little bit about this work that we're looking at behind here, Sasha. And I think um, you're going to, um, it's, it's inf inspired by Herbert Franca, and I think you're going to give us a quote of Franca's as well. Yes, so actually this is, um, that's so funny, I hear, <laughs> I think I hear Humanifesto playing from someone's phone <laughs> in the audience. Um, thank you for that. Um, this. 
<laughs> That's so funny. So um, this is actually the first two stanzas of an AI-powered poem that I was invited to, um, to contribute to the wonderful tribute to Herbert Franke. And uh, it's a poem called Repetai, the Orchid Cage, and obviously a sort of a tribute to, um, to, the, to the novel of that same name. Mm. And um, so let's see, where there's maybe, there's many layers to discuss, but I think to start with sort of the visuals of it, because I think you know you, you probably see parallels between what's on screen and even some of the uh, the images that are in the marketing materials for this event. This this whole series was really inspired very deeply by Franke in a lot of ways. One of which is that I'd had um, sort of one of those profound art encounters with um, his oscillograms series, and was really struck by the idea of the repetition in, in that kind of mapping of electrical currency. And it made me think a lot about, you know, the, the importance of repetition in poetic language, the importance of repetition in building pattern and subverting pattern, which cuts straight to the core of a lot of my work with text and technology, mm. which ultimately is about poetry as a kind of code, or, you know, how, how poetry yes. and algorithms speak the same language, yes. right? So I was really inspired by that. And so the, the visuals of this series, you know, I'm taking AI-powered text, which I'll speak about in a second, and I was very much inspired to sort of play with the idea of repeating it and kind of creating, um, you know, creating patterns that evoke that idea of electrical currency and that also evoke the idea of how poetry really relies on recursion, uh, reiteration. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, uh, poems are about building patterns. They're about mm -hmm. um, recitation and litany. Yes. They're about how we can say the same thing again and again. We can read the same thing again and again. Yes. And it will always mean something Absolutely. a little different. It'll always yeah. be unique to, you know, to whoever's on the receiving end. Yeah. And so that's actually at the heart of, um, of this poem and then the whole series that it comes from, which is called Repetai, and it is all, you know, all about this, and which I'll, I'll shamelessly say, because I was sort of stunned by this, but Repetai actually was recently um, given an award in the pre Ars Electronica, um, and I was really, you know, stunned and thrilled, like, as a poet to be, um, that's you know, marvelous to, to that, that poetry is starting to receive some recognition. You know, it's, um, it's, 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 that's a change definitely from 1968, yeah. 69. So would you read a little piece from it for us, Sasha, please? I would love to. Uh, and I should also say, um, with a quote from Franke, yes. which I need Let's to start with. Let's do the quote with Franke first. So, and this is what I meant to say before, but this whole poem really kind of came out of a desire to test an assertion um, of Franke's that I stumbled across in computer graphics, computer art, and he wrote that computer poetry is undoubtedly the most difficult task of the computer in art. And as someone who's been playing with computer, computer poetry for a long time, I wanted to, to sort of run with that. And so I, you know, I use this technique that I've been um, developing for a while. Uh, I have a bespoke or a personalized uh, AI co-author who is trained, fine-tuned, um, on all of my own writing and reference materials, mm -hmm. uh, rooted in a, a you know an existing large language model, but fine-tuned on on me and my interests, and we sort of you know we added in a few bits and pieces from the orchid cage from Franke's work, and kind of used that as a jumping-off point to create a poem about the novel. Lovely. So I just want to read it. It's, do we have time to? We do. Go right ahead. We've got four minutes, and we're going for it. Okay. So this is the orchid cage, uh, after Herbert Franke. One, on a distant planet, not too different from Earth, there stands a mechanized city with no visible inhabitants. The wind knocks once in a while. The silence is broken, unbroken. At its center, the eye of a hurricane, the heart of a flower. Two, the contest ends with a bang, the Earth is no longer a planet. Only two teams remain, the moon and the stars. You must choose one or the other. This game rules the world. This time, no one wins. What does it matter? Three, you must choose one or the other, the orchid or the cage. There is no third way you can't have both. You must make a decision. The orchid is beautiful, but will die soon. The cage is ugly, but will last 
forever. Four, you must choose one or the other, the light or the dark. There is no third way. You can't have both. You must make a decision. The light is beautiful, but it will blind you. The dark is ugly, but will protect you. Five, you must choose one or the other, life or death. There is no third way. You can't have both. You must make a decision. Life is beautiful, but it will end. Death is ugly, but will last forever. Six, you must choose one or the other, the past or the future. There is no third way. You can't have both. You must make a decision. The past is beautiful, but it will haunt you. The future is ugly, but will give you hope. Seven, you must choose the present. There is no other choice. There is no decision. The present is beautiful, but keeps disappearing. The present is a gift. You must try to hold on to it before it's gone forever. Eight, the choice makes, the orchid wilts, the cage steals, the city sleeps, the wind howls, the eye weeps, the flower's heart stills, the silence grows and breaks. Nine, in the end, choose wisely. No matter what happens, you can be happy. Orchids grow back. Cages can be opened. There's always another chance. In this city, on this planet, there is only life after life. 10. The orchid blooms, the cage empties, the city wakes, the wind whispers, the eye smiles, the flower's heart sings, the silence fades, the choice is made. And that was written by AI in honor of Herbert Franke. That's amazing, Sasha. The hair is standing up on the back of my neck. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me to share. Thank you. We have two more minutes. So just before, I mean, I hate to talk after that, actually. But all right, we have two more minutes. So we're going to use them. Um, tell me about your book, Technology, which came out uh, in 2018 or 20, 2021. 2021. Um, and also, where do you see AI going in the future from here for your practice? Oh, two very easy to answer questions. Um, well, the, thank you for asking about the book. So my, my book, Technology, is sort of a culmination of a lot of the work that I'd been doing, thinking about what it means to be a human in a post-human world, but also what it means to be a human poet grappling with the rise of generative language systems. And so, as I was sort of alluding to before, since 2018, I've really been creating this AI co-author, and I, I call this system technology. Um, technology you know, it's kind of a funny term, but it's a, it's a, it's a mishmash of technology and elegy, yes. right? Some people ask me if I've misspelled the word and <laughs> meant to say technology, but no, it's, but it's intentional. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I've used this portmanteau really because on the one hand, I, like so many of us, am really exhilarated by what technology promises to us. Um, and at the same time, I recognize that there's many, many, many challenges, um, many existential challenges, many yes. tactical challenges, yes. things that are you know, going to be lost, that are being lost, um, ways that we're being obsolesced in real time. And so this idea is really at the heart of um, this book, this collection of, well, it's a collection of poetry and technology and art. Um, it's all these things together. And it's really, I think at the end of the day, the, the best way to describe it is that it's a, a series of code poems, it's a series of AI-powered poems nested in its own training data, um, meaning it's my poetry in dialogue with the poetry of my, I don't know, my kindred co-author, this system that I've been sort of developing to be able to continue writing um, beyond and, and after me, and, and with me as well. Um, so yes, and I think to, to kind of segue from that then to your, your last question, um, I mean, I think as was alluded to in some of the earlier conversations, we were very much at the beginning. Um, I think H.G. Wells said something along the lines of, you know, this, this I'm terribly paraphrasing, but, you know, that humans are, are but the dream before the awakening. And as scary as that might be, there's something really beautiful about that too. Um, the reason I do a lot of this work, the reason I'm so drawn to it is because I think there's a lot that we can discover 
from putting these AI tools to work, to use, in meaningful and in, in clever ways. And I think, you know, if the job of a human writer, the job of a poet, is to write in order to discover more about ourselves, yes. to discover modes of expression that we haven't unearthed yet, that's always been the job of a writer, is to yes. say things that haven't been said, or say things that might not be speakable, um, then, you know, what can we do writing with systems that are purpose-built to ingest and process and analyze and synthesize all of human knowledge, which is what AI systems are. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for our ability to get to know ourselves better, differently? Uh, I just am continuously fascinated by that idea. And yeah, that's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, that's and it. and we, we, we have to stop there, sadly. But we wish you all the very best, Sasha. And we're going to watch you from now on and see how you're getting on. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much.